Father, we thank you for the opportunity we have to study the book of Jeremiah. We are pleased to be students of your word. We pray, Lord, that you will grow us into the men, women you've called us to be. We pray that in all things that your son Jesus would receive the honor and glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, welcome for those of you watching online also, and just a word for anyone watching. Uh, if you want to get the quiz, which we're about to go through, you go to the Shelter Rock Church webpage. You click on the line that says events on the top and then click on small groups, type in Jeremiah and become a member of that group. And then you can uh, access the resources that are associated. Well, I picked, put this quiz together this morning while I was uh, sitting with my mother in the emergency room at North Shore Hospital. Some of you may have heard that uh, I took my mother to the hospital yesterday because she, she just lost all strength on her, in her legs on Saturday. And um, on Sunday when I came home from church, my daughter uh, was taking care of her, but she was sitting on the floor. My daughter couldn't lift her up. She just kind of slid right out of bed onto the floor. And so I sought medical advice, and the medical advice was have her checked out, see if something is going on. Um, and so uh, yesterday, my son is an EMT with the Nassau County, and he, uh, he got gave her first class treatment because he was on duty in that area and uh, got her to the hospital. We got her a great section in North Shore emergency room. Um, private area it was really nice. But when I came in this morning, she was in the worst possible area, like the hallway um, with um, just, it's a zoo. It's an absolute zoo if you've ever been to North Shore Hospital. In fact, I just tried to get a hold of them. I tried calling three times to get to my mother's nurse's station. And it's such a bureaucracy. You just, you can't get a living being. Um, never succeeded getting through. Um, my point though is this morning when I was there, so I could be her advocate and make sure she gets what she needs, um, I worked out on this quiz. But you could also know that as I'm working on this quiz, I'm annoyed by the hospital, I'm annoyed by everything that's going on. So I was not a happy person working on this quiz. I was kind of uh, grumpy as I was uh, putting it together. So hopefully it didn't come across too grumpy, but uh, definitely has uh, some elements of that. So let's dig into our quiz. Um, the first question is this, the last king of Judah is Zedekiah, Asa, Josiah, Jehoiakim, Jehoiakim. Now the first, uh, well, two of these you should be able to eliminate pretty quickly. Um, and that is Asa. If you've been in this class, we haven't been talking about Asa. I've put his name on a few of the quizzes just to mess people up, but he's not a part of this uh, class in Jeremiah. He reigned much earlier. Um, Josiah is a part of the class, but he's not the last king. And I think that's been pretty clear. So you're left with uh, Zedekiah and Jehoiakim. And the answer is Zedekiah, Zedekiah. Um, and he, I mentioned Zedekiah on Sunday in Manhasset preaching on uh, Jeremiah 33. Number two, the last king makes an appeal to Jeremiah to ask, now by the way, the reason I put the last king is because I didn't want to give away the name in the second question. That was the answer in the first question. That was very smart of me, I thought. Um, the last king makes an appeal to Jeremiah to ask God, A, to take his life. B, do a miracle like in the days of old. C, receive his repentance. D, cause the Egyptians to fight in their defense. Now, um, some of these may be tempting, but the answer is he wants a miracle just like the old days. And uh, I get that. Wouldn't we all? I mean, that's a, that's a great question. Except uh, Jeremiah is not in the mood, you might say, or God doesn't instruct him to say, you know, God could do that. He's not going to because of the lifestyle of how you're living. Number three. Jeremiah gives what could be called a treasonous message. A, surrender, or li uh, surrender and live. B, revolt against the king. 
C, join the Assyrians. D, close the temple. And uh, the answer, Brother Ken? There you go. Surrender and live, which is treasonous when you think of it. The city is besieged. It's like, shouldn't we be fighting? But he says, the word of the Lord is this. If you surrender, you will live. If you fight, you will die. So he's encouraging them uh, to surrender and live. By the way, we're going to talk about a king tonight who actually does surrender in his three-month reign as king. Um, and they live as a result of it. This is an earlier occupation of Jerusalem. But with Zedekiah, he does not surrender. Jerusalem is destroyed. We'll talk about that later. Number four, the primary attributes that the Lord wants from his kings are A, justice. B, temple sacrifice. C, rescue from oppressors. D, circumcision. And when you look at this list, the prophets focus mostly on moral qualities, not the outside things like sacrifices, like circumcision. And so the answer is justice and rescue from oppressors. That is actually in the verses very, very specifically from last week. And this comes from chapter 21, verse 11, administer justice every morning rescue from the hand of the oppressor so that is the instruction of god to kings and this is very consistent of the prophets wherever we read them number five by way of metaphor gilead and lebanon convey a a barren desert b lush forest C, a place of judgment. D, defeated countries. And if you remember, you'd have to be in class to know this because they are used in a poetic way. But the answer is lush forest. In other words, a place that is good, not a place that is bad. And um, this is used regularly in poetic literature in the Bible. Um, they'll talk about Mount Hermon and its coolness its beauty, its snow. Um, there are repetitive poetic tools that are used. And uh, Gilead is, and Lebanon convey that. When you think of Lebanon, think of trees, cedars of Lebanon. And when you think of Gilead, the, the phrase that showed up earlier in the book of Jeremiah about there being healing there, a bomb of Gilead, um, bomb in the good sense here, not bow up sense, um, but that is uh, the conveyance. Number six, after Josiah dies, Jeremiah urges the people to weep, remember Josiah's justice, see, remember Josiah's help to the poor, D, avoid Josiah's sin. Now, if you did process of elimination, Josiah is one of the good guys. So D is definitely not the answer. The other three, all of them. He says, weep, we lost a wonderful king. You know, so he actually brings that up to weep. But then he asks the people to remember Josiah's justice and remember Josiah's help to the poor. Good king. Number seven, which king did the Lord say, he knew me? Now, I, I just pause at that question because that is such a profound statement of God. He knew me. I mean, wouldn't you want to know of your spouse that they know you? And, and good marriages and healthy marriages, we do sense that our spouse knows us. But when we think of God, I would love to, I mean, wouldn't you love somebody to say, Arlene really knows the Lord? I mean, she might be humble and say, I don't really feel that way, but it's a beautiful thing. 
if somebody could perceive that of you, wow, they, they know God. And there's only one king who that is said of. And it isn't David. It's definitely not Zedekiah. Hezekiah is a good king, but it wasn't him. It's Josiah. This young man becomes a king at a very young age. He dies suddenly in a battle against Egypt, which was probably ill-fated and a poor decision. But it wasn't sin. And the bottom line, he, the scripture says, knew God. God says, he knew me. Wow. Man, I want to do that. Paul says, I want to know him. I want to share in the fellowship of his suffering, become like him in his death, and so somehow to attain to the resurrection of the dead. Not that I have already attained this, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Paul had this ongoing desire to know Christ. Josiah knew God. And by the way, what does that mean exactly? What it tends to mean when we look at the Hebraic use of the word know is that he followed what God wanted, which means he knew him. One of the things that my family get a kick out of, and anyone who knows uh, Michelle and I, we talk to each other through movie language. And so we have this corpus of movies and we could just say a phrase and we know exactly what we mean. Um, I've, I've given this in class before, but let's say she pauses what we're watching on TV and maybe she's going to get a snack or something, but it comes back 15 minutes later and I've been sitting just waiting for, you know, the show to begin, to which I will say to her, where did you go for a man, Jamaica? Which is a line from a movie, 1776. And a another time from the same movie, if I do something, make a decision that surprises her that I'm making a good decision, she says, good for you, John. And obviously John is not my name, but that is when John Adams' wife, Abigail, is shocked that her husband actually made a good decision. And she says, good for you, John. But it's, I think, you know, I have to say, you know, if we lose one, of one another, um, Michelle or me, it's going to be a tough thing if I, you know, get remarried and like, you don't know the language, <laughs> you know. We had this all language built up. But... I think that applies to the Lord too. And when I hear, you know, let's say some preacher say something that just does not sound like God, I, you know, that's what my, you know, I was like, I don't think you know him. You know, I, it just, that's not the Lord I've come to taste and see, um, you know, in terms of what was, you know, should be done or what, how we should act. There is an ability to know the Lord. And I'm not claiming that I have a full knowledge at all, but you can smell when somebody doesn't seem to, to know the Lord. What is the scripture reference? Ah, great question. So the scripture reference for knowing that he knew the Lord uh, is chapter 22, uh, verse 16. He defended the cause of the poor and the needy, so all went well. Is not that what the Lord means to know me, declares the Lord? So it was his actions that reflected he is known, he knows God. All right, next one. Jeremiah calls allies of Judah. Now the NIV translates it allies. But if you were in class, you know that the Hebrew actually is a different word. Friends, enemies, frenemies, lovers. And the answer is lovers. Uh-oh. Ken had that astonished look in his face, which is not, not a good look, you know. Anyone get that right? Good, good, good. See, somebody was listening last week, Ken. What can we say? But yeah, it's, it's lovers. That's what he called them. Number nine. 
What famous prophet gets exiled to Babylon while Jeremiah is ministering? I mean, he's considered one of the major prophets. Is it Obadiah? Well, I kind of gave it away because he's not a major prophet. He's a minor prophet. Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jehoiachin. Now, if you're paying attention, Jehoiachin is, hold on, Pastor Steve. That's a king, not a prophet. So you could eliminate that one. So you're left with Isaiah, who's most assuredly a major prophet, and Ezekiel, who is a major prophet. Problem is Isaiah finished his ministry around 701 BC. So it ain't Isaiah, which by process of elimination means Ezekiel. So when I, I, Jeremiah is an old man, Ezekiel is a young man. And he is a going to be, tonight, we'll look at the section in which Ezekiel, his name will not be mentioned, but he will be taken off to Babylon. And uh, tonight is a passage which will mention that time when the, one of the exiles takes place. Uh, not the last one, but the uh, middle one. Number 10, last one. The last king of Israel is really the blank of the previous king. Friend, uncle, son, grandson. And the answer is uncle. Uncle. So he is not the direct descendant. It went the other way. And he was placed in that position by none other than Nebuchadnezzar. So the one who actually brings the ultimate destruction on Judah was somebody appointed by Nebuchadnezzar to toe the line. In other words, Nebuchadnezzar's way was, I want people to live under my authority, but they can have their own king, meaning from their own race, as long as that king swears allegiance to me. And that's what Zedekiah was willing to do. But later on, he gets cocky, and Nebuchadnezzar comes and crushes him, and that's how the whole destruction of Judah takes place. It's because this guy um, does not toe the line, according to Nebuchadnezzar. Yes, that's the same person. Same person. Same person. Zedekiah, uncle. And the reason I phrased it that way was not to give the answer to the first question in the last question. Because, you know, there could be somebody who might cheat with that information and, and reassign their answer. I wouldn't want that to happen. Okay. So I hope a few of you did well on this quiz. And... Uh, Amends, amends, you know, not, not great, not, not terrible. But uh, we're going to dig in to passages uh, tonight. And I looked at this passage tonight. P Pastor Leslie said to me this past week, she said, you like really love Jeremiah. And I find that funny because Jeremiah is not an easy prophet to love. I mean, it's like your daily dose of depression, you know, kind of thing. But I've come to, to love him. It's true. And when I saw on the preaching calendar for this past week that Pastor Henry had assigned Jeremiah 33, I was like, oh, good. And I knew I had a better lead on this passage than any of the other pastors. They're just not familiar with the book. They're familiar with the passage that they're preaching, but context colors the whole meaning of the passage. But I have the blessing right now of seeing that. So I'm saying this in the context of tonight's passage, which is Jeremiah 23 and 24. But in particular, chapter 23, he's going to spend most of the chapter rebuking prophets. Rebuking prophets. Now, the ministry of a prophet is very similar to the ministry of of a preacher or a pastor. Now, with a prophet, you're generally having the sense, particularly in the Old Testament, that they are proclaiming what God gave them in a vision, what God gave them in a dream, what God prompted them in their heart, or maybe God dictated to them. And when we think of preaching, 
we're thinking of somebody who is expounding the Bible. But that is a word delivered from God. And so when I looked at this passage tonight, I thought to myself, sometime in the future, when I am addressing preachers, I think I want to preach in this passage. And I have never heard a pastor preach to other pastors from this book, from this section, I mean. And what I mean very simply is preachers are not that familiar with Jeremiah. I would love to say that we preachers know the Bible cover to cover, every book, every verse, but that's not true. You know, preachers have to study these things like anyone else. And if you had asked me about this six months ago, I would have said, I'm not sure, you know, uh, you know, I know I read Jeremiah, but I'm not an expert on it. I would be very, very timid. And even after I'm done with this class, I won't call myself an expert, but I will call myself familiar with the book. And Pastor Nathan jokes all the time that I constantly talk about Isaiah. It's because last year I talked through Isaiah verse by verse. And as an end, actually it was two years ago. And as an end result, I'm very familiar with Isaiah now. And that book is so rich to me. Um, in fact, I will easily say it is my favorite book in the Hebrew Scriptures um, because of just being immersed in it. But with that being said, this chapter 23 is going to critique first the shepherds of Israel and then secondly the prophets of Israel. So with that in mind, let's look at chapter 23. And it begins this way. Woe to the shepherds who are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. Now, right there, you want to ask yourself, who are the shepherds? Anyone want to take a guess? It's the kings. Could argue that you could include priests. In a general sense, you could even throw in prophets. But primarily when Jeremiah uses the phrase shepherds, he's not referring to somebody with a staff watching sheep outside. He's talking about the king in the land. Now, there is a passage in Ezekiel 34 in which Jeremiah, excuse me, which Ezekiel is going to develop this even more. Now, I'm going to show you the Ezekiel passage because it colors what we're reading here. So Jeremiah comes first. So Isaiah is prophet. He's off the scene around 700 BC. Jeremiah starts 627, extends to 587 in terms of when he's writing. Ezekiel begins writing just about the time Jeremiah is finishing. And so that's, that's how you're, you get your parallel. But, okay, parenthetical thought. So when you, when you work on your doctorate, you have to generally write a dissertation. For what I have, the kind of doctorate I have, it's called a major project. But it's, it's like a dissertation, basically a 200-page paper. And in my project, I am talking about, my, my theme was breaking free from personality-driven ministry, which is one of the reasons why we've always had multiple teachers at Shelter Rock. I never wanted the church to be about one person. Uh, you know, people have a favorite preacher, that's fine, but you can get a cult of personality so easily when everybody just gets attached to that one person. But generally speaking, we haven't struggled with that at Shelter Rock Church because we have multiple teachers. And again, it's fair that we all have favorites, but it still works against the cult of personality. Anyway, I'm in, when you do your dissertation, after you write it, the next thing you have to do is you go for your defense. Now what that is, is you have generally three readers, three professors that bring you in and they are allowed to grill you on any question relating to your paper for two or three hours. It's a little scary. It's a little intimidating. Um, I briefed with Brother Nathan 
because he's very good at speaking articulately about theological ideas. And, and so what they asked me a question that I thought they were going to ask, and, and I used my Nathan answer, and it was like perfect, it went great. But then one of the professors said, Steve, you're talking about shepherds and how you can be a shepherd of a flock, like a church, like a pastor. I noticed you didn't talk about Ezekiel 34. And, and in fact, the, the beautiful thing that happened at the defense is I noticed you didn't talk about and I preempted Ezekiel 34. And he goes, yes, that chapter. I, and I, by preempting, I conveyed to him I knew what chapter he was talking about. And he said, clearly you're familiar with it. Could you add a section on that in your paper? Which I did. But here is a little synopsis of that. The word of the Lord came to me. This is Ezekiel. Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Now, Ezekiel is probably talking directly to the kings or the people purported to be leaders. Now, in Ezekiel's time, they're leaders in captivity, but they're still leaders. In the New Testament, Peter picks up on this image and calls them pastors. So the names are used interchangeably, pastors or leaders. Prophesy against them. This is what the Sovereign Lord says. Woe to you shepherds of Israel who only take care of yourselves. Should not shepherds take care of the flock? You eat curds, clothe yourselves with wool, and slaughter choice animals, but you do not care for the flock. Moving down. For this is what the Sovereign Lord says. I myself will search for my sheep and will look after them as a shepherd looks after his scattered flock when he is with them. So will I look after my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places where they are scattered on the day of clouds and darkness. I will bring them out from the nations and gather them from the countries. I will bring them into their own land. I will pasture them on the mountains of Israel, in the ravines and all the settlements of the land. So what we're seeing, and this is the whole chapter of Ezekiel, is about shepherds and woe to the shepherds, not caring for the sheep. I'm bringing that up because he comes after Jeremiah and he's building off what Jeremiah says here. Going back to our passage, verse 2, Therefore, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says to the shepherds who tend my people. Interesting note. You could circle that phrase, my people, shows up 40 plus times in Jeremiah. 40 plus times. So God is rebuking the people all through the book of Jeremiah, but he still views them as his people. That's a, that's a term of endearment. Because you have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not bestowed care on them, I will bestow punishment for the evil that you have done. Now, the English translation here, the NIV, has done a good job mimicking the, hero, uh, the Hebrew. Notice the word, they have not bestowed care, therefore, I will bestow punishment. That is a word play in Hebrew, which the NIV captured very nicely, because that is a little poetic way of saying, you haven't cared for the people, I will do extra care to punish you. So taking care of the people is a very, very big deal, declares the Lord, verse, verse 3. I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out from the countries where I have driven them, and I will bring them back to their pasture, where they will be fruitful and increase in number. I will place shepherds over them who will tend them, and they will no longer be afraid or terrified, nor will any be missing, declares the Lord. All that imagery is of a shepherd watching sheep it applied to a people. Now, this is the context. There are bad shepherds. Woe to those shepherds. 
they should have bestowed kindness, therefore I'm going to punish them. However, I'm going to gather this flock to myself. Now comes something interesting. If you went to church on Sunday, we preached on Jeremiah 33, verse 15 and 16, I think it was. Jeremiah 23, verse 5 and 6 is identical. Identical. So this will sound like Sunday. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely and do what is just in the land, just and right in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety. This is the name by which he will be called. The Lord, our righteous Savior. The Lord, our righteous Savior. Now, couple nuanced differences in the 33 passage, the city is going to be called the Lord, our righteous Savior. Here, the branch is called our righteous Savior. And the two can be flipped because the context is clearly referring to this righteous branch. Now, pausing for a second, this idea of a branch has a long biblical history. Isaiah was the first to use it, referring to the Messiah. Zechariah uses it, referring to the Messiah. And now Jeremiah uses it, referring to the Messiah. And they all connect. So let me give you a few examples here. This is Isaiah. Now the phrase comes not directly in this passage, but emanates from his branch passage. I'm showing you this one because it's very familiar, particularly in this Christmas season. Isaiah 9, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and the peace there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne, there's your connection, over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it, with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. You flip a few chapters over in Isaiah. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. That's that idea of a branch. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom, of understanding, spirit of counsel, of might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and he will delight in the fear of the Lord. Little parenthetical statement. If you ever read the book of Revelation, Revelation never quotes the Old Testament, but it alludes to the Old Testament more than any other book in the New Testament. And when you read Revelation 5, you'll see this phrase referring to the lion lamb that sits on the throne that he has the seven spirits of God. This is where it comes from. This description you just read, the seven spirits, this is the equation of the branch connected to the seven spirits of God. That's not my point right now. My point is the branch. He will judge what he sees with his eyes or decide what he hears with his ears, but with righteousness he will judge the needy with justice he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, another revelation image, and the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt, faithfulness the sash around his waist. Paul picks up that, that image in the end of Ephesians where he talks about wearing the armor of God. All these things are interconnected. If you know your Old Testament, the New Testament pops. Because you're like, ooh, that's this. And it makes connections. But here is the point in our passage. The shepherds of Israel have not been good. They've been bad. They've led the people in wrong directions. They have cared for themselves and not for the people, not for the poor. 
but someone is coming, a branch, and branch is synonymous with genealogy, somebody who descends from David, who will be everything you wanted a king to be, everything you wanted a leader to be, that will be him. And this prophecy has a two-part fulfillment in the first coming of Christ and the second coming of Christ, when all things are brought under his rule and leadership. But this is a glorious prophecy which Jeremiah gets in contrast of the kings of Israel. We need a good king. We need somebody who's going to carry us through. Verse 7, So then the days are coming, declares the Lord, when the people will no longer say, As surely as the Lord lives, who brought the Israelites out of Egypt, but they will say, As surely as the Lord lives, who brought the descendants of Israel up out of the land from the north, and out of the countries where he banished them, they will live in their own land. Now that, those two verses are exact repeat verses from chapter 16, verse 14 and 15. You just you know, flip back and you see, oh, the same, same thing. This is an example where the editor of Jeremiah is taking different pieces, and this could be another fresh statement but it is the same as the one that came in chapter uh, 16. Now, the name of the Lord, this is verse 6 now, the Lord, our righteous Savior. It's one Hebrew word, Sidkenu. Um, sometimes written T-S-I-D-K-E-N-U, Sidkenu. Sometimes if you see posters where it mentions the names of God, um, they'll put Sidkenu. The NIV breaks Sidkenu into two words correctly because some translations they'll put the Lord our righteousness. But the word actually means the Lord who is righteous that makes us righteous. That's why it would be the Lord, our righteousness. So by breaking it down, our righteous Savior, it's pointing out we didn't do this ourselves. He did it. So this is a beautiful word to describe God. He's the one who makes us righteous. And he does it. This shows up in the context of the branch, the descendant of David, who is to come. And Zechariah's prophecy about the branch, which I mentioned on Sunday, actually says that this branch is going to remove the sin of the people in one day, which points to Calvary. So it's a beautiful, beautiful image of what God does. He scrubs us clean. He makes us pure. So it's a beautiful thing. Now comes this very cheerful line the lying prophets. And this is the rest of the chapter. Now, this is, some, for the, some of you familiar with rhetoric, is the longest diatribe, diatribe in the Bible, the longest argument in the Bible about prophets against them. So this is the biggest argument. And scholars believe that what's taking place here is actually a collection of oracles that Jeremiah got about prophets all put together so that we can have them in one convenient spot. Now, before I read this, I want to just show uh, this little picture here. I, I, I get a kick out of it. It says in Amos chapter 7, I will drop a plumb line among you. And when you drop a plumb line, you're able to see if something is straight or not. And so this cartoon is pointing out Israel is not straight. It's crooked. What this section is going to do is point out that the prophets are not straight. They're crooked. Now, what this is going to be, I think, helpful for is for you and I, how do you assess a good preacher or a bad preacher? Now, we have a whole bunch of categories. 
One is the person interesting to listen to. I had a nice comment yesterday. Uh, actually, it's from a guy, a woman, uh, a guy's wife. And she comes to me and says, I just want to say, Pastor Steve, you're the only preacher that my husband does not fall asleep listening to. I appreciate that. That's nice to hear. I do appreciate that. <laughs> By the way, I was on a men's retreat once. It's, I don't know. You were probably around Ken when I... It was at Tuscarora. And all the men are in a big circle. And somebody asked the question, who has ever fallen asleep during a sermon? And I would say 80% of the hands went up of the guys around the corner. And, you know, me too? Yeah, you too, Pastor Steve. You know, it's just a funny thing. You know, everyone was, you know, men's retreat were trying to be honest with each other. And they were honest, brutally honest. They had all fallen asleep in sermons. But we'll measure a preacher on the quality of their speaking. Were they interesting? We'll measure a preacher on their broadness of knowledge. Do they have good illustrations? Does it seem to be that they know history and culture? And we'll measure that. But what Jeremiah is going to do is give us a measurement, which is a biblical measurement, because the truth is, you and I have listened to some very boring preachers in our day who spoke truth. But they were a little boring. They were a little dry. And we have listened to some amazingly entertaining preachers that kind of bent the truth or never got to heavy things. It's a tough thing. I did a preaching class uh, a year and a half ago. And actually, just a year ago. And in this preaching class, I, I quoted one of my professors from seminary. His statement was, as preachers, you are responsible to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. <laughs> so there was a young man in the class who has grown up in the church. He's now a missionary with uh, InterVarsity. He raised his hand and said, Pastor Steve, I grew up under your ministry. I heard a lot of comforting the afflicted. I can't say I heard a lot of afflicting the comfortable. Now, that was a nice little dagger, you know. But, you know, I paused listening to what he said. And I said, I will say this. Two things in my defense. One is I have a gentle way of saying difficult things. Once I fired an employee of the church and the chairman of the board who was with me, after we let him go, he, the door closed and he said to me, I know we fired him. I know you said the words, but that was like the nicest meeting I've ever had. And I said, well, I don't see why firing somebody means you have to be mean or not gentle or you know that kind of thing so my first argument was maybe it's the way i say it that sounds kinder because let's face it some of us have heard preachers that just sound mean and just sounding mean doesn't mean you're more godly it's what you're saying the second point i made though i said have you ever come to my bible class because in the bible class i can't skip any verses I have to say every single verse. And in those verses, I think there's a lot of afflicting the comfortable. And he said, it's true, Pastor Steve, I've never gone to your Bible class. So I said, I'm not saying there's something for me to learn in this. There is. My point, though, is when Jeremiah gives these statements, I want you to think not just some ethereal prophet from the Old Testament. I want you to think of preachers like me that we sit under and is there a rebuke here because if there is we need to own it that's what it comes down to so here's where we come into concerning the prophets verse 9 my heart is broken within me all my bones tremble i am like a drunken man like a strong man overcome by wine because the lord and his holy words. 
Now, this is Jeremiah speaking of himself. What he's saying, when he speaks about God, it impacts him deeply. In other words, it's like a controlling force in his life. Jeremiah 20, just a few chapters ago, but if I say I will not mention him or speak any more in his name, his word is in my heart like a fire. Shut up on my bones. I am weary of holding in. That's what he feels. He goes on. The land is full of adulterers because of the curse. The land lies parched. The pastures in the wilderness are withered. The prophets follow an evil course. Every time you see the word prophet, you could put, if you wanted, the preachers. The spokesman for God. Just because you're getting it from a vision or a dictation from God or a dream, a preacher's getting it from an inspired heart, a preacher's getting it from, hopefully, the Bible, but it's accomplishing the same thing. You're declaring the words of God. The prophets follow an evil course and use their power unjustly. Now get that. A preacher, a prophet, has power. You know what breaks my heart is every time I see about a pastor who got caught up into some affair with some uh, youth groom student, uh, some parishioner, because the pastors forget, present company included, that we have a power. And you can abuse this power. Because people every Sunday look up to you to be a spokesman for the Lord. And so if that person asks you out on a date, what do you do you know, with that? You know, and like, but, but Pastor, aren't you married? Um, oh, this is a friend. We're just doing it as a friend. And you're inclined to, to do something that you would normally not do because of the power that resides in this position. This is why I'm saying this is a great passage for a preacher to challenge preachers. How do you prevent doing that? I go on. Both prophet and priest are godless. Woo! Prophet and priest are godless. Even my temple, I find their wickedness, declares the Lord. Therefore, their path will become slippery. They will be banished to darkness, and they will fall. I will bring disaster on them, and in the year they are punished, declares the Lord. So he's given what they're doing and what the judgment is going to be. Among the prophets of Samaria, so that's northern Israel, I saw this repulsive thing. They prophesied by Baal or Baal. And led my people Israel astray. And among the prophets of Jerusalem, or Judah, I have seen something horrible. They commit adultery and live a lie. E they strengthen the hands of evildoers so that not one of them turns from their wickedness. They are all like Sodom to me. The people of Jerusalem are like Gomorrah, Therefore, this is what the Lord Almighty says concerning the prophets. Now, the comparison of Sodom and Gomorrah, pretty dark. Sodom and Gomorrah is like the poster child of God's judgment. So the key verse, the one I have circled in my text is this, second half of verse 14. They strengthen the hands of evildoers so that not one of them turns from their wickedness. What does that mean? Their prophetic word or their preaching coddles people in their sin. Let me show you some modern day examples. Pastor prays blessing on abortion clinic. This is a pastor in Washington, D.C. And this article comes from Breakpoint. But I looked it up independently. Breakpoint was founded by Chuck Colson, if you're familiar with that name. But I, I looked it up independently just to make sure I'm reading truth here. Because when I read this, I'm like, maybe I'm, I'm not seeing this right. 
but she actually goes and blesses the abortion clinic. What a great work. And actually said, when I walked in, I just felt such a spirit of joy and love and care. It was such a wonderful experience. I would say that this pastor is strengthening the hands of evildoers so that not one of them turn from their wickedness. Now, I'm not talking about the ladies who are going there for the abortion, who are in emotional turmoil and all those feelings. I'm talking about the perpetrators who can't make the connection that I am actually disposing of life the weakest life, the life in need of the highest level of protection. What does it say to a culture that is okay with not defending the weakest element in our culture? You know, when, it's, when you see a pregnant person, a pregnant woman, nobody says, how's your body doing? Everyone says, how's your baby? It's only when we talk in these ways to try to disassociate what we know is going inside that we move that way and then i came across this one in the christian post this is from the church of england heresy worshipers leave cambridge sermon in tears over claim jesus has trans body and they go on and explain and using the artwork and so on and so forth that Jesus identifies to, to trans and, and things like that. And then I can take a guess that every one of these preachers, pastors, believe that they're doing a kindness by affirming people, by, you know, uh, holding up people, you know. And they, they actually feel they're doing good. But as best as I can see it, they're strengthening the hands of evildoers so that not one of them turns from their wickedness. Now, every time I talk about stuff like this, I always like saying, I live in a glass house. Pastor Steve, are there times when you've coddled people in your preaching? I think I probably have. And sometimes somebody may come up to me and said, Steve, I, I don't think you hit that hard enough. And it, it could be a true statement. That's, by the way, why we have the body of Christ, to speak truth one to another. One of the things I love about Shelter Rock is that we have multiple teachers so we can challenge each other with what is truth. And I, I remember somebody came up to me, dear friend, love this woman in the Lord, but she came up to me on a Monday and said, you had a very rich passage you were preaching from on Sunday, and I felt you kind of like, just kind of like scratched the surface of it, and there was a lot more meat in the bones that you didn't give us. I appreciate this sister saying that. I just look at these examples, and I say, that's something we need to watch for in our preachers. Would we not agree? Is this a preacher or a prophet who is coddling us instead of challenging us? I would just say challenging doesn't mean you're smacking somebody upside the head. You can challenge somebody gently, but you need still to challenge. We move on. Verse 15, therefore the Lord Almighty says concerning the prophets, I will make them eat bitter food and drink poison water because of the prophets of Jerusalem. Ungodliness is spread throughout the land. This is what the Lord says. Do not listen to what the prophets are prophesying to you. They fill you with false hopes. Now, I'm going to pause because that's a transitional verse what god is saying in verse 15 is the prophet should function as the conscience of the christian culture it should function as the conscience of the christian culture i have something a, a drum i've been banging on quite a lot this year and i even brought it up sunday 
that Christians need to be memorizing Scripture. Because I hear all the time, oh, Pastor Steve, I'm getting too old to memorize Scripture. Oh, I can never do that. I said on Sunday, if I was in an elevator with you and you had 60 seconds, and I'm going to ask you, hey, in the 60 seconds, give me all the promises of God you can remember. And my bet is a lot of those would be, do, 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 some people would have something to say, but it's one of the things that I'm trying to bang the drum on that we can learn scripture. I don't believe there's anything as too old. As long as you have some cognitive ability, you can put a few words together in your mind. Minimally, know where these scriptures are found. So when you need these promises, you have them. But that would be an example of trying me trying to do what I feel God is saying. So we're switching categories now because remember what the prophets of Israel were doing? There's going to be no invasion. God loves us. He's a God of love. Do not listen to the prophets. They're not prophesying. Do not listen to what the prophets are prophesying to you. They fill you with false hope. They speak from their own minds, not from the mouth of the Lord next noticeable thing for preachers or prophets. When you're taking from Scripture, it's called exegesis. It's bringing from the text. When you're reading into Scripture, it's called eisegesis. You're bringing into the text your own ideas, your thoughts. And that's something we always have to be careful. Is what I'm preaching today Steve's idea or is what I'm preaching today from the book. And he's saying these prophets, they're taking it from their own head. Verse 17, they keep saying to those who despise me, the Lord says, you will have peace. And to all who follow the stubbornness of their hearts, they say, no harm will come to you by which of them has stood, excuse me, but which of them has stood in the counsel of the Lord to see or hear his word. A preacher or a prophet should be, to use the example of Moses that Paul makes reference of, do you remember how you could always tell that Moses was with God? He had to cover his face with a veil. It was like everyone knew, whoa, he was with God. The best preachers you should be able to have a little hint that they spent some time with God. Imperfect as they are, bad preachers as they are, there should be some kind of hint that they were in the presence of God. And again, it's not about just a clever turn of phrase. It is about, you could tell that somebody's coming with kind of a conviction. Um, that's why I love that passage. His word is in my heart like a fire, a fire shut up in my bones. I am weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. So he goes on. Who has listened and heard his word? Question mark. Now Jeremiah speaks of himself. See the storm the Lord will burst out in wrath, a whirlwind swirling down on the heads of the wicked. The anger of the Lord will not turn back until he fully accomplishes his purposes of his heart. That's Jeremiah preaching. That's the kind of giving that conviction. He goes on, in the days to come, you will understand it clearly. I did not send these prophets, yet they have run with their message. I did not speak to them, yet they have prophesied. But if they stood in my counsel, they would have proclaimed my words to my people and would have turned them from their evil ways and from their evil deeds. So that's the message of conviction. And now comes an awesome theological description of God. Verse 23. Am I only a God nearby? So we'll pause there. Is God only a God nearby? 
In other words, is the only God who's like right here, declares the Lord, and not a God far away. One of the things I find interesting is traveling all over the world, visiting missionaries and finding that God is there when I got there. It's just fascinating. By the way, I'll give you some inside information. You know how we're raising money for Thanksgiving for the missionaries in Mongolia. Now our plan was to raise um, 30 originally, the original number. 30,000, anyway, to build a bathroom unit for this camp. But then we found out that Duya, the missionary's uh, wife, one of the missionaries, I mean, she preaches too, but she is in Germany for surgery that they're paying with their own money. And her husband, Jargal, was just about to sell his car to pay for the surgery for his wife we took in $62,000. We're paying for the surgery. Praise the Lord. I mean, the, the Lord provided the money there. But my point here is the Lord, am I just a God who's nearby? No, I'm the God who's everywhere. That's the theological point. He goes on, who can hide in secret places so that I cannot see them, declares the Lord. Do I not fill heaven and earth. So this is the omnipresence of God, that he is everywhere. King David says in Psalm 139, if I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I go to the far side of the sea, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths of the earth, you are there. You knew every day of my life before one of them came to be. You wrote them in your book. Beautiful description of God in the same way. But here is a beautiful passage that shows up in systematic theologies to describe God being everywhere. Verse 25. I have heard what your prophets say who prophesy lies in my name. They say, I had a dream. I had a dream. How long will this continue in the hearts of these lying prophets? who prophesy the delusions in their own minds. They think dreams, they tell one another, will make my people forget my name, just as their ancestors forgot my name through Baal worship. Let the prophet who has a dream recount the dream, but let the one who has my word speak it faithfully. For what has straw to do with grain, declares the Lord, is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, like a hammer that breaks a rock to pieces. That is the power of the word of God. Very strong language. Now, he's not critiquing having a dream. Jeremiah has dreams. He's critiquing, is this a dream from the Lord? And by the way, New Testament prophecy is not the same of Old Testament prophecy. There are prophets in the church but here's what Paul writes. The spirit of the prophets, people who have a gift of prophecy, should be judged by other prophets in the room. In other words, you test the prophets. And again, one of the things that I love in Shelter Rock Church is we test each other's sermons. So when somebody's writing a sermon, like Pastor Leslie will forward her sermon to me and say, what do you think, Pastor Steve? Pastor Nathan will forward his sermon. I'll forward my sermon. Before Easter, every year that I was senior pastor, I sent out my Easter message to all the staff, everyone, custodian, you name it, to read my message and give me any critique that they wanted. Because I'm going to be speaking to two to 3,000 people, and I don't want to blow this. And so I want to hear it. That's being tested. What's happening here? These messages are not being tested. They're, they're giving their dream and it's coddling the people. Verse 30, therefore, declares the Lord, I am against the prophets who steal from another's words, supposedly from me. Yes, declares the Lord, I am against the prophets who wag their own tongues, yet declare. The Lord declares, indeed, I am against those who prophesy false dreams declares the Lord. 
They tell them and lead my people astray with their reckless lies. Yet I did not send them or appoint them. They do not benefit these people in the least, declares the Lord. Now, I'm going to end this section with this uh, statement. One of the things that people have challenged the pastors here at Shelter Rock on staff of not preaching the word is because we don't endorse certain political candidates. I'm saying that because I, we get that a lot. They say, Pastor, I mean, I had it on Facebook just uh, three weeks ago. Somebody said, oh, I, I, I posted on Facebook that we gave away $22,000 at church today to prime the pump for people to be generous to others. Somebody wrote back, stop tickling people's ears and preach about the election. Now, I know what the person wants and I know what they're, they're saying. They're looking at immorality in our culture. They are genuinely convinced that one party speaks exclusively for immorality and that the other party is from the pit of hell. This is what their, their mindset is. But as a preacher, I do not feel the scripture has released me to speak and say, this candidate, good. This candidate, bad. What I do believe the scripture has released me to say is these are principles found in scripture. Live them, honor them, and vote your convictions. But the moment I cross the line and say, you should vote for this person, I didn't hear God say that. And I don't hear the scripture saying that. So I, I'm just giving you an example because this happens in the evangelical community where there is a sense that that is speaking with conviction. I think that is eisegesis. That is taking my opinion and then making it declared from the pulpit. I believe the Holy Spirit can do the heavy lifting on that kind of stuff. I do not need to, nor should I. Now, you may not agree with me on this, but I'm telling you, this is uh, my conviction. I know it's Pastor Henry's conviction, too. We do not feel we are going to blow in the breeze because somebody says we should preach against this candidate or that candidate. But what we need to do consistently is preach what the Bible teaches, and hopefully our congregation will vote wisely, accordingly, based on the word that they've heard preached to them. This is just an example of how we preachers can be pushed in a direction which I don't necessarily think is preaching God's word directly. I am off my uh, soapbox now, but that is, that is my take on that. So the next category is false prophecy, false prophecy. Now the NIV kind of makes something a little muddy here. Here's the line. When these people or a prophet or a priest ask you, what is the message from the Lord? Say to them, what message? I will forsake you, declares the Lord. So here's what the NIV is missing. If you look at other translations, it'll say, when these people or prophet or priest ask you, what is the burden from the Lord? Say to them, this is the burden. So some of you who grew up in certain traditions, Pentecostal traditions, um, might hear a pastor or somebody in your church say, I have a burden from the Lord. A burden means two things. It can mean a weight, like I'm carrying a burden on my back, or it can mean an oracle, a word. And sometimes you have this intermix, like Jeremiah has some words that are hard to give and they're heavy. And so you can see the connection. But the Hebrew is conveying that they say that they have a burden from the Lord, which the NIV translates message. But they're, it's playing a pun here. I'll give them a burden. It's kind of like I took you into, brought you into this world. I'll take you out of it. That is the kind of sense that's coming in this pun. 
Verse 34, if the prophet or priest or anyone claims this is a message from the Lord, I will punish them in their household. This is what each of you keeps saying to your friends and other Israelites. What is the Lord's answer? Or what has the Lord spoken? But you must not mention a burden or a message from the Lord again, because each one's word becomes his own message. So I love that phrase. Ever been to a Bible study in which everyone has their Bible open and then somebody says, well, I think it means this. And then the next person says, well, I think it means this. And that's what exactly he's saying here. Each one's word becomes their own message. And what that does, it gives you a pass on knowing that there is a definitive understanding of what this passage means. And some passages are hard to understand. Let's be honest, there are. But there are others that are very, very clear. Pastor Steve, I I'm wondering if I should keep living with my girlfriend or you know, not live together in the same house. And I said, I can tell you straightforward, very clearly, stop living with your girlfriend or get married with her and I can perform the wedding this afternoon. That's what it comes down to. It's not a hard thing. There are some things which are black and by the way, I have done that. They, I have performed wedding right in my office, right there, ready to go, let's do it. Because if you're not gonna separate, I mean, you've been living with this person for seven years. First of all, I feel like smacking the guy upside the head. Come on, really now? Honor this woman. If she loves you and you love her, marry her. You know, be done with it. But anyway, that is an example of there is a clear interpretation. There is no passage which implies enjoy living together in sexual freedom, you know, for as long as you like. And then when you're tired of that person, abandon them. Which passage did you find that? You know, it's just not in the Bible. And so he's saying, don't go that way. So distort the words of the living God, the Lord Almighty, our God. Notice the power he's saying, distort the words of the living God, Elohim, the Yahweh, uh, El Shaddai, El. I mean, he's using all these words to describe God, to emphasize, don't make up your own in translation here. This is what you keep saying to a prophet. What is the Lord's answer to you? What has the Lord spoken? Although you claim this is a message from the Lord, this is what the Lord says, you use the words, this is a message from the Lord. Even though I told you, you must not claim this. This is a message from the Lord. Therefore, I will surely forget you, cast you out of my presence, along with the city I gave you and your ancestors. I will bring you everlasting disgrace, everlasting shame that will not be forgotten. That is a hard, hard pronouncement for these shepherds. So, as I went through this in my own study, don't you think this would be like a good sermon to preachers? I, I think it would. I know I needed to hear it, and I think a lot of preachers need to be reminded of this. One thing, again, I've learned over the years, anything on this, I don't look out the window only, I look in the mirror. You know, where am I weak on this? Where, where have I blown it? Because we can constantly be better. So one story, and then we're going to this last chapter, which is a very short chapter. We're, we're good on time. So um, in May, I wrote to a church in Nevada. And just, it's, it's the biggest Baptist church in uh, Las Vegas. I said, uh, I'm going to be moving there. I said, if you have any links to be a pastor in that area, I would be uh, you know, happy to talk to you because I'm, you know, I'm thinking of that. The guy writes back and says, I actually have a position in Boulder City, Nevada that I would be interested in uh, finding somebody. Um, tell me more about yourself. So I have more you know, communication that way and before you know it, we have a full-blown interview. Interview goes incredibly well. Then I have another interview, goes incredibly well. In fact, the guy says, I have no one else I'm looking at. I'm like, wow, this could actually happen. 
And then he, I said, well, I'm going to be out there first week in July. He says, well, I don't want to hire you without meeting you. So you know, why don't you come out? So um, I come out. We have our meeting. Good interview. But I could tell at the meeting something changed. Just something changed. I get a call from him two weeks later saying um, another candidate showed up. I went in that direction. And I'm like, okay. I was weird to me because I thought like, wow, this is like really happening. I originally thought to myself, he really wanted to hire somebody August 1st. And I could not come until January, the earliest. And so I figured, uh, you know, he just wanted somebody earlier. What can I say? It wasn't a big uh, campus. It was like 120 people, something like that. Anyway, this Thanksgiving weekend, I am just surfing the net. You know, you have some time in Thanksgiving and you, you surf the net. And I thought, you know what? They hired that guy at that church. I think I want to check out who they hired. You know, so I, I went to Boulder City Hope Church, which is what it is. And I clicked on, it said November 18th, and it is the guy I interviewed installing the new pastor. And I'm, I'm listening to him. Now, the pastor stared with his family. First thing I noticed, he was in his 30s. And I thought, the church is mostly in their late 60s and 70s. So I thought, that's actually good to have a young guy there. So I thought it was a positive thing. Young family, beautiful. But then this is what the guy who interviewed me said. He said, you know what? We, we, you know, when we look for the pastor of this church, you know, when we looked, we saw people who had clear vision, strategy, direction on how to you know, minister in a church. But the one we picked exemplified just such beautiful humility and that's what made us go in this direction. Now, as I'm listening to him speak, there were only two candidates for this position. So I am the one with strategy, goals, vision, and the guy they took was the guy with humility. And I, I'm watching this video. So this, this I watched this Saturday night. And I, uh, I thought, wow. And here I, I wrote my dissertation on humility. So I, I replayed my conversations with him. And I don't think I came across as an egotistical pig. I, I don't. In fact, after he said he went in a different direction, last July I asked to debrief. It was my first interview in 20 years. Can you tell me anything to learn? And he said, actually, your interview was perfect. It's just that I really felt the Lord moving in this direction. And... Um, that was good. My point, though, is when I saw this on Saturday night, I thought, this is probably a little lesson for me to learn. That I want to, it doesn't matter that I'm experienced and I, and I do know some things about how to lead a church or ministry. Never leave the idea that humility comes first. That I need to approach, I mean, that was what Jesus did. He washed feet. So it was kind of an interesting, subtle rebuke, which I honestly think is from the Lord, because I had the inspiration to look of all the sermons I could have clicked on. That's the one I clicked on. And it just so happened that he was talking about how they reached the decision for this. So at first, my response was to write to the guy and ask him, did I come across as egotistical? You know what I'm saying? You know, and I said, no, 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 Steve, that's the wrong thing. I did write to him, though, and I said, I think you made the right choice because I think he'll be a good pick for that church. And he wrote me back today and said, thank you so much, Steve. I really appreciate that. And then he asked me what's going on, you know, news and that kind of thing. All of this is to say, read passages that rebuke. Don't look out windows. Look in mirrors. That is where God does his greatest work, is when we're willing to understand, hey, this could apply to me. Okay, Jeremiah has a very unusual little vision here, which is our next section. After Jehoiakim, son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah and the officials, 
the skilled workers and artisans of Judah were carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. The Lord showed me two baskets. Now I'm going to pause there for one moment. So you might want to make a note. This section, two baskets of figs, that's the heading. But chapter 24 through chapter 29 is all about these three kings that come after Josiah but they're not in order. So it's gonna be from the period of time of 605 BC to 587 BC. So chapter 24 through 29, <coughs> excuse me. It's going to culminate in one of everyone's favorite verse in the book of Jeremiah. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Plans to prosper you, plans for a future. That's gonna be the bookend on the other end. But we're not there yet. So this first thing after Jehoiachin, that's 597 BC. So even though the section starts at 605 BC, it's not in order. It starts with Jehoiachin. And so what I want to do is give you now a little... Uh, Oh, by the way, I didn't even show you this. I, I clipped it. The NIV shows you, this is the burden of the Lord. So when these people or prophet or priest ask you, what is the message of the Lord? That was the NIV. Here's the new revised standard version. When this people or prophet or priest ask you, what is the burden of the Lord? What shall you say to them? You are the burden I cast you off. In other words, I just wanted to show you how different translations translate that, but I forgot to. But so... This verse 20, uh, verse 1 of chapter 24, here is the story in 2 Kings of Jehoiachin. Jehoiachin was 18 years old when he became king. He reigned in Jerusalem three months. Nice long reign, huh? He did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Wow, three months and he could still screw it up. <laughs> he did not even evil in the eyes of the Lord as his father had done. At the time of the officers, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, advanced on Jerusalem and laid siege to it. And Nebuchadnezzar himself came to the city. While his officers were besieging it, Jehoiachin, king of Judah, his mother, his attendants, his nobles and officials, all surrendered to him. Now, do you remember the word of Jeremiah to Zedekiah? You surrender, you live. You fight, you die. Jehoiachin, he lived. He stopped being king. He went into exile, but he lived. Here's the rest of that passage. In the eighth year of the reign of the king of Babylon, he took Jehoiachin prisoner. As the Lord had declared, Nebuchadnezzar removed the treasures from the temple of the Lord and the royal palace, cut up the gold articles that Solomon, a king of Israel, had made for the temple of the Lord. He carried all Jerusalem into exile. That's a hyper hyperbolic statement. All the officers, fighting men, and all the skilled workers and artisans, a total of 10,000, only the poorest people of the land were left. So, when we read in our passage, after Jehoiachin, son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, and the officials and skilled workers and artisans of Judah were carried into exile. So, that's now 697 BC. This is the uh, second exile. First one, 605. Second one, six, uh, 597. Third and last is 587. That king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, the Lord showed me two baskets of figs placed in front of the temple of the Lord. Now, king has just been taken away. Jeremiah is still in Jerusalem. The Lord shows him two baskets of figs. Okay, interesting. We don't know if this is, there were actually two baskets of figs sitting on the temple or whether he's having a vision or a dream, but he sees these two baskets. One basket had very good figs, like those that ripen early. The other basket had very bad figs, so bad they cannot be eaten. Then the Lord asked me, what do you see, Jeremiah? Figs, I answered. The good ones are very good but the bad ones are so bad they cannot be eaten. Then the word of the Lord came to me. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel says. 
like these good figs, I regard as good the exiles from Judah whom I sent away from this place to the land of the Babylonians. So this is very, very important because this is a picture of grace. So there, this is 597, 10,000 people are taken away, the cream of the land, if you will, including the king. And God says, I am regarding them as good. Now here's the question, were they good? No, they're under judgment. But here's grace. God does this. He looks at my sister Mary and regards her as good. Even though sometimes she can be mean. He regards Ken as good. Even though sometimes he can go off the rails. He still regards as good. It's a beautiful picture of grace. In other words, he's going to move graciously with them. Verse 6, my eyes will watch over them for their good. And I will bring them back to this land. And I will build them up and not tear them down. I will plant and not uproot them. This is that shepherd, that good shepherd. I will give them a heart to know me, that I am the Lord. They will be my people and I will be their God. And they will return to me with all their heart. Sometimes when I'm reading a passage like this, I think, which verse is a good one to memorize? This one is that verse for me tonight. I will give them a new heart to know me. Because I want to pray that prayer. This is my prayer. Lord, give me a heart to know you. Give me a heart to know you, that you are the Lord. It's a, it's a simple prayer, but you and I can pray it. And he's going he's gonna to do that for the people that are go, going off to Babylon. But... The bad figs, which are so bad that they cannot be eaten, says the Lord. So I will deal with Zedekiah, king of Judah. Now, this is the guy that Nebuchadnezzar appoints to be king after Jehoiachin is taken away. His officials and the survivors from Jerusalem, whether they remain in this land or live in Egypt, I will make them abhorrent and offensive to all the kings of the earth a reproach and a byword, a curse, an object of ridicule. Wherever I banish them, I will send the sword, famine, plague against them until they are destroyed from the land I gave them to their ancestors. So this is what's going to happen in 587 BC, 10 years later. They thought, oh, we pulled, we got her out of it. You know, we surrendered. We kept everything intact. The temple's still here. We survived. But people, because they're obstinate, they're bad figs, it's all going to be destroyed 10 years hence. And it's all focusing on this one shepherd, Zedekiah, leaving people astray. All right. I liked tonight's passage. I did. Um, maybe because it's talking to preachers and prophets, and I, I feel like I can identify with that. But to quote my sister, Pastor Leslie, again, you love the book of Jeremiah, Pastor Steve. I kind of do now. There's so much to learn for me that I need. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for giving us words of Jeremiah, which we admit we can't always understand. And yes, it's a little confusing sometimes on the dating of these various oracles. But we see so much truth as to what matters to you. You want shepherds that act justly, that stop oppression. And you want prophets and preachers that speak your convictions, not our own whimsical thoughts. Father, help us to have preachers like that today. Help Shelter Rock to seek every week to preach what your word says, not what our little whims feel. And we pray that in the end we would be honoring to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys, and have a great week. We will meet next Monday.